Was there a particular event or time you recognized that filming was not just a hobby, but that it would be your life and your living? The first time I really thought I could make a living from movie making was the last semester of my college. I was so fortunate to get an internship with Precinct 13 Entertainment. I learned so much from the crew's combined years of experience. Each one had an impressive resume. I absorbed everything I could and I didn't want the dream to stop. As my internship was coming to an end, they actually offered me a paid job on set for the production of The Rage that fueled the fire to my own resume, which has grown over the years. Is it harder to get started or to keep going? What particular thing did you have to conquer to do either? Uh, it's pretty easy to get started. I think keeping going is where it takes a lot of discipline. Uh, both you have to kind of overcome inertia. One is to start moving and one is to stop. But where I think you get better as a filmmaker is you do projects that you may not necessarily love as much, uh, but you spend more time uh, forcing yourself through those and then you'd be surprised that actually something you didn't think was gonna be successful actually becomes that way. So it's just, it takes discipline and a little bit of fortitude to stick to it. What advice would you give to someone who wanted to have a career creating film? Uh, the best advice is be prepared for sacrifice. There's going to be times that uh, you would like to roll from one project to next project to next project. Sometimes you have to wait for everything to align. So there's a little bit of patience as well. Uh, it's, it would be wonderful, like I said, just if everything just rolled right continuously into the next one. But sometimes you just have to have patience to get everything uh, perfectly aligned and then be willing to jump and grab on uh, when the opportunity presents itself. What was the most important lesson you had to learn that has had a positive effect on your film? How did that lesson happen? One lesson I had to learn is to step up and make the hard calls. If something needs to change, even if it's not the popular opinion, but in the long run will improve the outcome of the film, then it needs to be done. As a producer, you shoulder so much of the responsibility and ultimately the success of your movie can depend on those abilities. I found this to be a hard step for me to take. In most cases, I'm at home in the camera department and would prefer to be everyone's friend. Producing fell in my lap out of the need our group had. One time that comes to mind that I had to make a hard call was after I had taken guidance on who should take on the role of director for All In. The original director had to step away from the project due to scheduling conflicts, and he offered up his own replacement. Filming started, and we were only days into the shoot, and I made the call to replace the director. I know, to some, this seems crazy, but after the change, I saw the crew rally behind my decision, and it steered the production back on track. In the long run, I think everyone was happy with the new jobs they had. You are a collaborator. How, many, how have you discovered members of your team and how do you keep the relationship with them strong? It's one of those things with uh, filmmaking, you sometimes try to have a core group and hang on to them, uh, but the reality of it is, is sometimes they may have other needs and desires and you have to be willing to let them go. But it's one of those things that sometimes it's just very lucky you get in the right place at the right, right time. Uh, sometimes you're just completely desperate. You'll take anybody who's willing to hold uh, a boom mic over the head for eight hours a day or more. Uh, but it's just, it's one of those things you have to be flexible. Uh, it's nice when you have a chance to sit down and go through resumes and uh, do a due process and you know what the corporate world would expect. But sometimes you have to work with what you got and uh, I think the most important thing is be flexible with that with the collaborations. You are here at the Louisiana Film Channel's Movie of the Week. You are here because of your work and how do you do, how you do it. What are personal attributes that make you for a good filmmaker and what do you do to foster them? Well the personal attributes I think it's flexibility. Uh, it's, it's great to have very high standards it's in high expectations, but sometimes you have to temper them with the reality of what you've got. Um, 
we want everything to be perfect, but in order to do that, we need a lot of time and we need a lot of money. And sometimes you don't have both of those, so you have to adapt. So flexibility and adaptability, I think, are going to be very important things as a filmmaker. Uh, and then also realizing there are some things that you can compromise on. There are some things you shouldn't, uh, but you're going to have to be flexible. When I wanted to devote my life to making movies, my first decision was New York LA, or L.A. Uh, how does this, uh, how does where you live influence how and what you make, and how do you think Louisiana currently affects your work and processes? It's one of those things we're very blessed with uh, the film industry coming to Louisiana, and it kind of changed the dynamic. I met like when I was a little kid, like four years old, watching TV. I thought, oh, that's just around the corner. That's not on a soundstage or. Uh, that's not filmed in Hollywood. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, like I said, we were very lucky when it came here. And a lot of people were able to take advantage of that and grab on with both hands. Uh, it's, we're kind of on the other end of that right now, which is kind of sad, but unfortunately things come and go as everything does in life. But it's one of those things we're very lucky and uh, for a lot of people working within the unions and whatnot, they actually accrued uh, hours and time faster here than they would if they were in LA or New York. So there were definitely some perks and we got a lot of people out here that probably would never have uh, looked twice at coming to Louisiana and they got to uh, do things. So it was a really great process and I think it was a really great time for Louisiana. What makes a film great for you? Are there certain qualities that make a film better for you? The sound, the characters, the acting, the timing, the cinematography, all should be considered as equally important to a great film. To me, a film is all about telling a story. Everything you place into your film, the dialogue, uh, to the props, to the lighting, to the special effects, uh, up to the music and sound, and even the editing tells your audience something. A great film gets your story, your concept, your idea across to your audience clearly. What films have been the most inspiring or inf influential to you and why? The Big Blue, a 1988 French movie adapted to English, has been the most influential to me. The movie has a great storyline about two friends who are also competitors. The visuals, the cinematography told the story. That movie showed me a new way of telling the story, not only through dialogue, but through the pictures and the video. Are there common qualities in cinema today that you dislike? Is there something you try to subvert, avoid, or rebel against in your work? There are no real qualities that I dislike per se. I believe each movie has its own special qualities. There are many stories that are hard to watch. There are many words that are hard to hear, but it is all part of the story and the idea the filmmaker is trying to get across. I cannot think of anything that I consciously tried to avoid. We are all here presumably partially because we love cinema. How did your love for movies get sparked and what can we as a community do to help others discover a similar pleasure? My love for cinema began as a child. I was one of the first generations that was brought up on TV. The TV was my babysitter. I watched movies and TV shows and was always curious about how it all came together. In the community, using the knowledge I have gained, I teach many classes on video production and feel that I am helping spark the interest of film students across the area. Generally speaking, when we want to learn about a film, we talk to the director, but those that make films know how much they are really collaborations. What makes a fruitful collaboration? What do you do to enhance the collaborative process? A film, whether it is a small production or a huge production, takes a whole lot of collaboration. There's the cast, the camera crew, lighting crew, wardrobe, makeup, so many different aspects to the creation. And everyone has a job to do. Knowing your job and meeting the needs of the movie and being a team is essential to the end. It is said that there are only six stories, maybe 12. It's all been done before and we've seen it all. What do you do to keep it fresh? Is there anything you can do to subvert the process to keep it original? Well, there's an old adage, and I don't know 
who it's attributed to that I always follow as a writer, which is, it's not the tale, but he who tells it. The stories that we have today have been around for centuries. They've come from myths. They've come from uh, the Christian Bible, from other faiths, from, from legends, all over the place. And they've been yeah, recycled through, throughout the years. I, I don't know if anybody can really put a quantifiable number on the amount of stories there are, but uh, I'd be interested in seeing that. But for me, as a, as a writer, I don't concentrate that much on story, at least at the first. I like to connect to a, uh, a good idea, a good idea that's, I, I really would like to live with for a while. Um, filmmaker David Lynch called it the big fish. And I would say just immerse yourself totally with your imagination into the characters and situations that have come about from your exploration of the big idea and just let it see, see where, see where it takes you, see where it takes you and let that process dictate story. Story is important, but I think story for me is something that you really look at after you've at least, you know, gone through one or two drafts and you start, you know, applying narrative logic and things like that to it. But I would say uh, right off the bat, I wouldn't, I'm not necessarily concerned about story. Now, there are other ways an author can also uh, play around with structure, uh, with time sequence and uh, techniques like that. But, you know, to each his own. We get noticed because of our success, but we create them on the back of our failures. We learn best from the experiences where it doesn't work, yet we still only discuss the success, not the failure. <clears throat> what failures of your own have you been able to learn from? How did they change you and your process? We cannot learn without mistakes, without failures. I try my best just as a person to learn from what went wrong. During production, our movies can get hectic because we are teaching along with getting a movie shot. I have learned to keep more of a level head. When things get hectic, step back, take a breath, and get back to what is important, the love of teaching and making the best movie we can. It all starts with the script. Maybe not, but when do you know a script is ready to shoot? What is your process of getting it there? A script is ready to shoot after it has been broken down and most of all, the pre-production aspects have taken place. As you go through securing locations, casting talent, and even table reads, the script continues to evolve, bending to the will of the group. Also, by this point, you feel as if you have memorized it, and that's when I know it's ready. Several directors have told me that most of directing is actually casting. Regardless of whether or not that is true, some actors have it and sometimes they need something to make it pop. You've spotted that it and captured it. What is it and how do you find it? Well, I agree that casting is, well, depending on who you talk to and most of the directors I've ever talked to says it's 95 to 98% of the battle, so, so to speak, uh, a battle to have a successful project. Uh, it's, it's phenomenally important and it's, it's auditioning and casting is, uh, it's very, it's, it's, it's in a craft that you really have to hone over the years. I can, the casting team for Waiting and Watley did a wonderful job and, uh, I, I thank them for that. It was wonderfully cast. I have been a theater director for over three decades, so I also have some personal thoughts on it. Uh, what is it? Well, first off, it, it, working from the outside in, it's, it's looks. Uh, is there someone whose face you're automatically drawn to if you see it on the screen or, or on the stage? Um, you know, do they look like the character that you're casting? 
and and that's very important. But it goes it goes beyond that to what's working behind their eyes, what's what's going on in their mind. Uh, if an actor comes in and reads for an audition and he's just very flat, he's just a basically a you know a rubber wall bouncing dialogue off off his partner or whoever he's reading with. That's not it. For me, it is seeing that the actor has done some sort of preparation and at least created in his own mind some type of inner life or background for the character. And so that when I see the, when I see him audition and I see it, I know that he's really thought about it, even though it may be just a short read, he's really thought about it and he's 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 putting a lot behind it and I can see something I can see the wheels turning up in his head. Uh, and the final part of it for me as a director uh, that I determine during a casting process is how well can I communicate with them? And oftentimes the only chance you have is during an audition where if it's a read, you can step in and give them some simple direction. You know, it may be something broad. It may be something that doesn't have to do with the script itself or the story. But you see then how well you could communicate with them and whether they, in turn, uh, understand your direction or you have a connection with them. Because if you can't determine that, and sometimes you can't, you're going to have a kind of a rough road uh, getting your project done, be it a film or a play. So that's basically the different levels of it for me. Is the film business uh, fair? Why or why not? Uh, how do you make the apparatus work for you? And no, the film business is not fair. It's kind of sad to put it that way, but that's, it is a business. Uh, there are many projects that people create where they look at it and it's like, no, this is not going to be the best film ever. No, this is the film that's going to turn a profit. Uh, and you obviously see that and people get upset when a film makes money, but not enough. Uh, and then there are some films that you look at and go, they made a sequel? Okay. So, it, in a perfect world, it would be fair, but it, sadly it's not. You just kind of have to adapt to it and be prepared. And there are going to be some projects you don't enjoy as much, uh, but the ones that you do, grab on and hold on tight and uh, get the most enjoyment you can, because the next one may not be, because that's the, the joy of working in movies. You want to keep working. Is it the filmmaker's responsibility to find and develop your audience? Why do you feel that way? Uh, I don't think it's necessarily your responsibility as a filmmaker to do find and develop your audience. It is your responsibility to find and develop content. Uh, you want to, if you make the projects that people enjoy, your audience will find you. We now have so many different means of getting your, uh, your story uh, out. It can go straight to the web. It can be, uh, you know, uh, it can be a traditional film. It could be a movie of the week. Uh, there are just so many more options, you know, and it kind of changed the game back in the 80s when um, you started doing music videos in the short form really hit its stride and there are some directors that you know where they come from they came from commercials because they had to tell a story in as short a time as possible and during that time there are some directors that became very famous and in demand just because they could effectively tell a story did they find an audience did they develop an audience no they satisfied the audience by making good con uh, content what role have film festivals played in your life so far? Why are they necessary? How do you get the most out of them? Uh, film festivals are very important for the artist because it's an opportunity for them to get their content out. Uh, also, uh, be recognized by their peers. One thing that, was, uh, that happened in my life is uh, the LA Film Prize that's shot up here in Northwest Louisiana. Uh, we did one of the first ones called Killing Time. And the goal was if we won the prize, which I believe at the time was $50,000, it was not that we were going to get paid. It was we were going to use that to put into reshooting the film to make it better to send to other film festivals and film, uh, uh, film contests. And it's just it's one of those things that you want to keep developing your craft. And 
this is one that's what's really nice about the festivals you get a chance to be seen you can get some positive feedback uh, and you get to interact with movie fans and then also the most important thing you get to network because that is key is finding out who who to talk to about getting certain things or you know hey, this is available if you don't do that you'll never know I am a big believer in the importance of social media in many aspects of the film process. Are you on social media and do you use it in your work? Why or why not? I am on social media and I use it personally and for my work. I do believe social media is essential these days, especially for up and coming filmmakers and actors. It is a way to find an audience and a following that could help with the growth of your career. When I got started, there were two screens, the movie screen and the television screen. Now there are also computers, tablets, and phones. Screens are everywhere, the home, the bus stop, the elevator, the taxi cab. As a creator, how does this affect the stories you tell and how do you tell them? Uh, it's one of those things, it's, uh, you know, we have t uh, TVs built into refrigerators now, the back seats of cars. Uh, not just to mention airplanes. So there are so many different possible ways of uh, getting your stories shown. Um, it's actually, you know, it wouldn't surprise if, you know, that's not mentioned there is, you know, having it on your watch. Uh, but it's one of those things that we live in interesting times where we have the ability to create so much. We have the technology that allows us to do that for a really minimal investment to make a really good product. Uh, and it's it's one of those things that you don't necessarily have to write in two two and a half hour movie to uh, tell effectively tell a story. If there is one or more thing you think would make the film industry better, what would it be? I think really the best thing it comes to is people need to make more films. Uh, how do you get better at doing anything? You practice. You have to do it. Uh, and also doing things out of your comfort zone to a certain extent. You know, push your own boundaries. Uh, it's, that's the way you get better. You challenge yourself. If you do something that's safe and only wait till the situation is perfect, you're gonna have uh, a not. You're not gonna have a chance to learn because I, I believe one thing we learn from failure. Um, even if you do something that's not not as successful as you, the criteria you set for yourself, I think it is important to try. And I think that's one of the things is how you develop um, your skill set using your equipment, uh, using your actors, which are also equipment. You know, using their abilities and working with them. So um, I think the key is is you need to. Uh, to develop your craft, you need to continuously be working and challenging yourself. Do filmmakers have any responsible to, responsibility to culture? Do you feel that being a creative person requires that you give back or tell a particular story? Why or why not? Um, uh, that's obviously a fun situation. It's kind of loaded. Um, it's, it's interesting when you take a step back and you look at uh, uh, movies and TVs and then you go into theater and radio and whatnot and all the other different media uh, formats we have of telling stories, which going all the way back to caveman time in front of the campfire. We always have these um, times where it's used as a tool to communicate the message. Uh, like in theater and whatnot, there was times that the church used it to help communicate the morality uh, of what you should and shouldn't do. Uh, one could argue what, what you see on network TV right now would have a hard time getting on HBO when it first started in the early 80s. Uh, so things are, boundaries are being pushed. Um, I think the one thing that is nice about uh, our world right now, if you don't agree with a message that someone's putting, you have so many options, you can choose what you want. I don't think we should uh, turn off the pipeline for someone. Making someone uncomfortable and making them think about situations 
is a great thing. But I think it's, it's one of those things that by making people think, it makes them think about the issues in just a slightly di uh, different way. It gets them out of their preconceived ideas and maybe think, hey, maybe there's something else out there. Um, but to have to culture people and to educate them, be a useful tool is like, yeah, we've done that, but we've always, as creators, we've gone beyond it. Of course, then there's time when there's pushback, but I think it's fun in, when you study the history and you see where uh, we're, you know, the creators are used as a tool to get the message out, and then we start spreading out and doing more than we should, and then they kind of like, ooh, you shouldn't be doing that. And it's always a continuous cycle, and it's, it's interesting to watch how that is continually unfurled. What inspired this story or film? Waiting in Watley is based on a short play that I had written titled Homecoming, and that play had been produced in Chicago. When the uh, producers uh, read the show, read the play, uh, they had the idea to expand it into a feature and asked me if I would expand the story, the characters as such, which I did, which was a, a wonderful experience for me as a writer. The genesis for the play and the film, it's based on characters and experiences that I had growing up in a small town in West Texas. Where did you find your cast? The entire cast for Waiting in Watley was found using local auditions that we posted on the Bossier Parish Community College website. This process happens yearly, so it provides a reoccurring opportunity not to only the actors to gain audition experience, but for us to see them grow. Watley's cast included four actors that had collaborated with us in the past, and we gained several new actors that this was their first big role. What is your next project? Well, I just recently finished redrafting a, uh, a short feature script. Uh, it's a psychological thriller called Tipix uh, that I'm hoping to get produced. I'm also working to complete uh, my third book of plays, uh, getting those ready for publication. And this summer, I will be directing a production of a play by a British author, Eleanor Cook, uh, and the play is uh, called Out of Love. And it hasn't really been produced very much here in the United States, and uh, I'm looking very much to uh, diving into that. Uh, I had to take a year off from directing because you know, of the pandemic, and uh, I'll be doing that at the Canterbury Summer Theater in Michigan City. Any unique issues encountered, and if so, your creative solution. Waiting in Watley required an active diner, and based on the shoot schedule, we needed to film over the lunch hour to accommodate the class that was working with us. Finding this location took lots of searching, and when we finally found a place that would let us, the big catch was they didn't close. So as customers wandered in, we would just take breaks, or if they wanted to stay, we added them to the background. Our one actor who played the cook even fooled a customer into thinking he worked there. Of course, this all slowed the process of getting shots done, but it was neat to actually have the look we wanted for the location. Is there anyone you would like to acknowledge or thank uh, from the project? Well, certainly I would first like to thank the producers, the Bipsy Film Institute, um, especially Ray Scott Crawford, and Ronna Leber. Uh, I would like to thank the director, uh, Keith Bruce, who always has always championed my work. And then finally, I would just uh, a huge thank you to the cast and the crew of Waiting in Watley, all the uh, imaginative and uh, wonderful work they did. Uh, they were filming it during a very, very hot Louisiana summer. <laughs> and I thought it turned out wonderfully. And I'm very, very proud of their accomplishment, and so should they be. And also, finally, thank you to the Louisiana Film Channel. 
What do you look for in a script? We have a unique process for scripts each year. It's a competition. The college offers script writing, and we encourage our students and the public to submit their best works. Then in the fall, a group of selected judges read each submission and choose one to produce the following summer. So the winner of the script competition allows the writer to get their script made into a movie. How do you select a director? Once we have a movie selected, that helps in choosing a director. For Waiting in Watley, we looked for someone that was familiar with the writer's works. This provided insight into the style the writer was trying to convey, ultimately helping the story come to life. I also looked for a director that can take up and coming actors that are still growing and really pull out a performance. That is a quality that is really important when working in a teaching environment. What checks and balances do you make when managing budgets? Hmm. You basically have to say no a lot. Uh, it's nice when you have uh, a daddy warbucks that can keep giving you money and uh, allow you certain freedom, but you can't continually do that. Uh, and there are some things that aren't worth doing that, but you really have to be prepared to say no. Uh, if you need more, you have to be able to justify what you're asking for. And sometimes it's very easy to do that. And there's other times it's just you're asking for the moon and it, you know, you're not going to get that. Here's a nice little star. Um, so you have to be flexible. But you also have to be realistic because if you spend all your money making a project and you don't have any money left over, to do anything else or you've put it to where you're stuck paying for a film for a long time that really ties your hands so you really have to be prepared to say no have you ever had to handle a difficult conflict in your career i think difficult conflicts come up more often than we would like but being able to adapt and problem solve is key in one of my earlier works, a fellow crew member got mad, and the next thing I knew, the floor and my legs were covered in coffee. Well, I'm glad it wasn't piping hot, but I did end up smelling like coffee for the rest of the day. To this day, I still don't know why or what set him off. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. However, witnessing that experience has acted as a reminder to keep an eye open on the crew's emotions and anticipate situations. I also believe I am a person they can come to to solve issues. Making movies should be fun, and I've had several sets of experiences where it didn't feel like work, even though we worked super hard each day. What would you change in a movie you produced that you believe would make it better? The very first movie I produced, I would go back and change how casting unfolded. That movie required the most actors I've ever had to deal with, and I think we could have seen even better performances had some of the actors switched roles. It was a massive amount of work to keep scheduling straight, and a few things had to be adapted on the day. If someone didn't show up, the schedule was just so tight, we had to keep moving forward. But like so many things in life, we learn by doing, and I think I've grown as a producer since then.